Good morning. morning. Welcome to Earl Street Baptist Church. We are so glad to have you here this morning to worship with us on this beautiful Sunday morning here in February. If you're a guest with us today, and we know we have special guests with us this morning, we want to extend a very special welcome to you today. We're glad that you are here with us. We would encourage you to look in front of you in the pew pocket. There are guest cards there. We'd invite you to take one of those guest cards out to fill it out and then drop it in the offering plate when it's passed later on this morning in the service. We're just very glad that you are here to worship with us today. We want to remind you about our swap and shop that is coming up on February the 22nd. We've been providing you with information about this and there is a very detailed article about this in the newsletter this week. So if you'll make sure you check out your newsletter this week, read that article and then plan to be here on February the 22nd for the swap and shop. For the next two Wednesday evenings, we are pleased to host sessions that are designed for both parents as well as teens on sexting and cyber safety. These uh, these sessions are part of a program that has been developed by the Julie Valentine Center in partnership with the Greenville County School District. They're presented in response to the growing concerns about teens' online behaviors and their access to inappropriate content as well as inappropriate people. Studies are showing that kids are sexting, cyberbullying, and being approached by strangers online in increasing numbers. The session this coming Wednesday evening is designed for parents, grandparents, and any adults who want to learn more about this issue. The session this Wednesday evening will last about 45 minutes. It's going to start at 6 o'clock, and it will take place in room 300, which is the large room on the third floor in the new building. There's no cost to participate, and this is open not only to families here of Earl Street Baptist Church, but also to families in our neighborhood and our community. So if you uh, know some parents, grandparents, or adults that need to be aware of this information, need to participate, please invite them to come with you on Wednesday evening. Again, the session Wednesday night is for parents, grandparents, and adults, and it will start at 6 o'clock. Then next Wednesday on the 5th of February, that session was designed for the students and for the teens. There will be specific sessions for middle schoolers as well as high schoolers since the content will be more age specific. So this Wednesday evening is for adults. Next Wednesday evening is for students and teens. There's a very long article about this in the newsletter and in your bulletin this morning. So make sure that you read that information and participate in this important sessions if it applies to you. Today is Scout Sunday. We want to welcome our scouts and their families to worship this morning. We are very glad that you are here, and we are glad to have you here with us in worship. At this point in time, I'd like to recognize Joe Jones. He's going to come forward, and he's going to recognize the scouts. And as Joe is coming forward, if you'll take a moment to take your cell phones out, make sure you put them on vibrate or on silent. Thank you, Denise. Uh, I know y'all probably aware that we have a scouting program. We meet every Tuesday and every Thursday, but it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. And uh, if, if you don't know somebody involved uh, intimately, then you probably don't, aren't even aware that we have a program going. But we do have a, a really good group of people that come, leaders, uh, and, and it's such a great program. First, I'd like to ask anybody that's been involved in scouting as a youth or, or your children or something, just raise your hand if you've ever been involved in scouting or, or has touched your life. Good, good group of people. And also, I know we've got other Eagle Scouts here. I, I'd just like to ask our Eagle Scouts if you would stand up. Let's give these guys a big hand. That takes a lot of dedication on the child's part, the youth's part, but also on, on the parents. And, and now our Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts, if you guys would please stand up. Let's give these guys a big hand. Thank you guys. As a youth, it takes a lot of dedication uh, to be able to take the time to, to participate in the program. We've got several boys now working on their Eagle Scout. I think we've got five, if I'm not mistaken. We've got one sitting right here that's just about got his done. So really, really arduous process, but uh, well worth it in the end. And again, I just want to thank you, Earl Street Baptist Church, for making this program available to our youth. Thank you.
Will you join me in the call to worship? Let us be honest this morning. We have sinned. We try to pretend that we haven't. Or we rationalize that others do it more than we. But the truth is, we have sinned. We do or say or think judgmental things. We fail to respond to an obvious need. We want what is not ours. The list is long, and regardless of what is on it, all that matters is that we have sinned. join me in prayer. Father, we come to you to worship this morning, praising your faithfulness, giving thanks for your mercy, seeking your joy. Thank you for creating us and giving us life and breath today. Thank you for, our son, for your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who sacrificed his life for our sins and for the Holy Spirit whose presence here unites us as your people. Fill us with your peace today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
good to see you all this morning. You know, when we hear stories from the Bible, we often hear stories of people who trusted and obeyed God. Noah built the ark, Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, and the shepherds followed the star to find Jesus. But we also hear stories of people who didn't obey God. Adam and Eve ate the fruit they weren't supposed to. Jonah ran away instead of going to Nineveh. And Judas betrayed Jesus. Some people in the Bible obeyed God, and some people didn't. And guess what? We're the same way. Sometimes we obey God, and sometimes we don't. We're human and far from perfect even when we try our hardest to live the way God wants us to, we will still fall short. But there is good news for us. God sent his son Jesus to save us from our wrong choices. Jesus died for our sins so that we can be forgiven. All we have to do is believe that. It's hard for me to understand how God, who is perfect, can love me, who is not. But I'm thankful that he does, and that because he sent Jesus, I get a fresh start every day. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for these children. Thank you for loving us and taking care of us, even though we are far from perfect. We thank you for your son Jesus, and for the fresh start we get every day because of him. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Will Middleton, and I am the Sunday School Director here at Earl Street. And I wanted to let everybody know that February is I Love Sunday School Month. And so during this month, I uh, want to put an emphasis on Sunday School here at Earl Street. We love our Sunday schools. We have 18 classes that, that span over three different hours, starting at 8 a.m. for you early folks. Um, Two classes in that early hour, six classes in the 9, 10 hour, and 10 classes in the 10, 30 hour. So we really, love our, we really love our Sunday school. We want everybody in our congregation to be uh, participative in that. And uh, if you want to join a class, you want to know more about a class, you haven't picked a class yet, find one of our great staff members, find me, um, find a class. And uh, if you want to know more, you can find out. Thank you all. Let me add my welcome to our scouts and their leaders and their families today. We're so honored that you're here today. And we want to let you know that we do this every Sunday. And we'd love to have you come back any Sunday uh, to be our guest um, as we worship together. Let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious God, as we gather to worship you this morning, we acknowledge that you are here with us even as you hold the entire universe together, you still care enough about each of us to be present with us. May everything we say and do today demonstrate just how much we love you in return. We do thank you for these scouts, for their families, for their leaders, and for all that they do to make this community a better place. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us. Even though we all have sinned and fall short of your glory, you love us as your very own children. While we were yet sinners, you sent your only son, Jesus, to live and to die for us so that we may be reconciled to you through faith in him. Words are inadequate to express our gratitude. So may our lives be an offering of thanks for your love. And may our lives be an offering of your love to the world around us. Let the light of Jesus shine through us and let us be known as people who love you and love our neighbors. As your family of faith here at Earl Street 
Help us to love each other as you have loved us. We remember our brothers and sisters who cannot be with us this morning because they are hurting and just don't have the strength to be here. We remember those who today are grieving the loss of someone they love. Give them a special measure of your presence and your peace. Assure them of your love for them and our love for them. And lead us to demonstrate that love in meaningful ways through acts of service and kindness and encouragement. Above all, we pray, Lord, that you will help us to live the greater way and to become more and more like Jesus, in whose name we pray and in whose name we worship. Amen. Please join me in the offertory prayer. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, giver of good gifts and perfect gifts, I thank you so much that, that you delight in loving us. Thank you for your love, your care, and concern. And Father, I thank you so much for the wonderful blessings that you have provided for our church and for each of us. And as we come to this offertory, Lord, I ask that you would bless these tithes and offerings, that we may use them in a way that will be pleasing in your sight. And may we always seek guidance and wisdom from you in how we use the offerings that are provided. These things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. 
Amen.
The scripture reading this morning is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. As I read these words of scripture, I invite you to listen for God's word for you and for us all. <clears throat> Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus, for in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind. Just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him, you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. I thought I might get a little response there. <laughs> Have you ever thought about the way we just throw around those terms, saints and sinners? For example, I cannot tell you how many people have said to me, Sylvia must be a saint to live with you. Uh, now, obviously the people who say that are not aware of the fact that the word saint comes from the word holy, and Sylvia is anything but holy <clears throat> just kidding but she's not as holy as you might think she is that was, uh... in the catholic church the term saint is not some word that's just flippant, flippantly used it's an official title that is conferred upon an individual through a formal process of canonization after he or she has demonstrated an extraordinary measure of holiness. Some people use the term exclusively for Christians who have died. So in some people's estimation and definition, you have to be dead to be a saint. And sometimes that is the way we talk about the deceased, as if they were saints. Um, Sylvia's mother used to say of her sister-in-law, that if she would just stay dead long enough, her brother might actually learn to love her. <laughs> the longer she was dead, the more nicely he spoke of her. You know how it is with the passage of time. The longer someone is gone, the more likely we are to confer upon them the title of saint. So with the passage of time, the word saint has come to be used, at least in popular usage, in juxtaposition with the word sinners. You're either a saint or a sinner. But you cannot be both. The opposite of a saint is a sinner, right? And we're all sinners. Can I get an amen? That's right. Well, what do you think? So are we, can you, do you have to be either a saint or a sinner? Is the opposite of saint a sinner? Well, I want to introduce you to a church that had more than its share of problems. This church that I'm going to tell you about was divided in just about every way you can imagine. First of all, it was divided over personalities. It seems that in this congregation, everybody had his or her own favorite pastor. Some people liked the former pastor better than they liked the current pastor, and they were choosing sides in this division. There was a man in the congregation who was living in sin with his own father's wife. Church members 
were suing each other in pagan law courts. The congregation was divided over worship styles, over dietary laws, over the role of women in the church. Some people were getting drunk during communion. Some people were debating doctrinal issues. I'm telling you, this church was a hot mess. So when the founding pastor of the church found out about the condition of this church, he was inspired to write a letter to the church addressing some of the issues that were destroying and dividing the church. They were destroying the church from within. They were destroying the church's witness in the world. And so this pastor felt compelled to write them a letter. And if you were that pastor, I'm just wondering, you're writing this letter to this church that had gotten so messed up. Um, how would you have addressed the letter? Dear so-and-so. Dear jerks who messed up the church I established. Dear adulterers. Dear drunkards. Dear partisans. Dear sinners, well, in case you have not guessed by now, the church to which I'm referring, I'm referring to the church in Corinth, and the founding pastor to whom I'm referring was the Apostle Paul. According to the book of Acts, on his second mission trip, Paul had brought the gospel to Corinth early in the year A.D. 50, and it was through his diligent work there that the church was established. He stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, and he worked hard to establish that church on a firm and solid foundation. And then once he felt secure enough to leave the Corinthian church, once the church was up and running, he continued and moved on to the next location, completed his second mission trip, began his third mission trip as he revisited some of the locations he had already visited. So some four years or so had passed since he had left the Corinthian church in good shape. But in that period of time, the church had gotten off track. Sometimes that happens in churches. Sometimes it doesn't take four years for it to happen. And when Paul learned of the struggles of the Corinthian church, he wrote this letter to the Corinthians. Now you might expect that the first letter that he wrote to the Corinthians would be the letter we call 1 Corinthians, right? That's what you might expect. But apparently, 1 Corinthians was not the first letter Paul wrote to the church in Corinth because in 1 Corinthians, he refers to his previous letter. So shortly after he wrote his previous letter, he followed up with this letter that we now call 1 Corinthians, which he wrote from Ephesus on his third mission trip. After learning how messed up the Corinthian church had become, he writes this letter. And if you read through the letter, you'll realize he just takes one issue at a time and deals with it. As a pastor myself, I can only imagine how Paul must have felt when he realized the situation the church was in. I've tried to imagine, as I've prepared this sermon, how I would have felt if I had learned five years after I was gone from this church that the church had just fizzled out or fallen apart or gotten off track. First of all, let me encourage you by saying that I usually have the exact opposite effect on churches. When I leave, the churches take off. <laughs> I can cite you one example right after the other. So that should be an encouragement to you. You have that to look forward to. Your best days are ahead. But I have imagined how Paul must have felt as a pastor. Was he wondering if the church had just gotten too attached to him so that when he left, the church just <coughs> fell apart? And if so, was Paul taking a lot of blame on himself? What did he do wrong? Looking back, it seems like the church started unraveling almost as soon as he left. And some people might think, well, Paul must have been a real good pastor if the church fell apart after he left, but actually the opposite is true. The church should never be built around the personality and ministry of the pastor. Pastors come 
and go. And that's the first issue Paul addressed as early as verse 10 of chapter 1 in this letter. As soon as he gets through with the greeting, he gets right into this issue of division over the personalities of the pastor. So I wonder how Paul may have assessed his own effectiveness as his, of his ministry when he learned of the church's problems. I wonder if on some level he blamed himself for the mess the church was in. But as a pastor, I found myself wondering what Paul was thinking and feeling about the church itself, the people in the church he had left. You know, some pastors may look back on the people who had made a mess of the church and blame them or call them out or judge them or condemn them for what they had done. Many pastors would not be able to resist the temptation to just dismiss and disregard a congregation that had come and become an embarrassment to them. Some pastors might take the attitude that it's not their concern anymore. What the church does after the pastor leaves is the church's business. No concern of the former pastor anymore. Some pastors would probably not have even bothered to write a letter in the first place. And if they did, it would have probably been accusatory and condemning. But not so with Paul. Paul might have had a missionary's zeal. And he might have had a theologian's mind. But he had a pastor's heart. He had spent 18 months of his life with the church in Corinth. He had invested time and energy in that church. He had gotten to know the people there. Faults and all. Just as they had gotten to know him. Faults and all. Like any good pastor, he had been with them. And he had been for them. He had shared life with them. The good times and the bad. The times of joy and the times of sorrow. He understood them. He identified with them. And he could disapprove of what they were doing and still love them as the flawed sinners that they were. And that is because Paul had a deep understanding of his own sinfulness, his own shortcomings, his own failures. He understood how easy it is for us to slip into unacceptable behavior. He knew how easy it is to cave into the culture around us. He knew how hard it was to remain true to the gospel that had set them free. Paul loved these people. Like any good pastor, he loved the people he served. They were like family to him, and they always would be. Every good pastor knows what my former pastor Ansel McGill used to say, the church is never as good as some people think it is, and never as bad as other people think it is. As a pastor, Paul knew not only what the people in the church appeared to be, he not only knew what they wanted to be, he knew who they really were. Because pastors get to see people at their best, and pastors get to see people at their worst. And good pastors love their people no matter what. So, how does Paul begin the letter? How would you have begun it? How does Paul address the people in the Corinthian church? You're not going to believe this one. By referring to them as saints. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church which is at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together, with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on from there to say, I give thanks to God always for you. It might seem strange to us at first glance that Paul would call these imperfect, sorry, flawed, sinful believers, saints. 
but not when we realize that in the New Testament the word saint refers to anyone who is in Christ Jesus. Any believer, living or dead, who is a part of the universal and eternal body of Christ. The word saint is derived from the same stem as the words holy and sanctified, both of which mean to be set apart. The word holy in the purest sense of the word refers to God and God alone. The scripture says there is only one God and there is none other, which means that God is set apart from all other human beings. God is holy in a way we will never be holy in this life. But the scripture teaches also that we are to be holy, that we are to be set apart, that we are to be saints, that we are already saints. And of course, that is the rub. Because to be a saint is by definition to be set apart. And we are set apart not because of our qualifications or accomplishments. Not because of anything that we have done for ourselves. But because of what Jesus has done for us that we could never accomplish on our own. We are saints not because we have earned the title, but because we are being made holy by God's grace in Jesus Christ and our faith in him. And so the terms saints and sinners are not mutually exclusive. In the New Testament, saints are sinners who are being sanctified who are being made holy by God's work in us and through us. That work of sanctification, as it is called, is an ongoing transformative process that will not be complete until God's work in us is finished. Saints and sinners, saints are sinners who are being made holy by God's grace in Christ. The story is told of a medieval peasant, a poor traveling man who passed by this monastery. It was a walled monastery with a wall all the way around it and was kind of like a self-contained village. The monks in that monastery grew their own crops. They had their own well water. Everything contained within those walls was pristine and clean. It was a brutally hard, poverty-stricken age. And yet these monks had found a way to be self-sufficient. They didn't really appear to struggle in the world like this poor peasant did. This peasant had passed by this monastery many times and one day he happened to see a monk from the monastery and decided to strike up a conversation with him. He went up to the monk and said, what's it like to live in in a place like this? What, what is this? Are you a, a, a bunch of saints? And to his surprise, the priest simply said, we fall down and we get up. We fall down and we get up. The saints are just the sinners who by God's amazing grace fall down and get up. Every 
Saints are not people who have achieved, achieved some state of perfection. Saints are sinners who are being made holy by God's grace in Jesus Christ and our faith in him. So this morning we invite all sinners to trust Jesus to do for you what you never could do for yourself. We trust you to give, we, we invite you to trust him and give as much of yourself as you know how to as much of Jesus as you can understand. We invite you to renew your commitment to Christ, to come forward and kneel and pray. We invite you today to join our church. We welcome you into this family of sinners who by God's grace are being made holy. However God's spirit leads you to respond, I will be here at the front to receive you as we stand to sing. Would you be seated for just a moment? It's a real delight and pleasure for me to be able to present to you Deborah Gilreath, who comes today to join our church by transfer of letter from another Baptist church. This has to be maybe some kind of record that um, this is her first time here. Uh, she was recommended, this church was recommended to her by her former pastor in Rome, Georgia. And she, we've been in contact this week uh, by email and she has checked us out. <laughs> but then today she showed up for the first time and she said to me, I know that this is where I belong. 
and this is where God is leading me to be. And so we rejoice in this, and we believe that, that the Lord himself brought, him, brought her to us, and so I want you to do everything you can to make her feel welcome and introduce yourself to her and um, give her a warm Earl Street welcome. So if you will, receive her as a member and make her feel welcome here and do all you can to help her find her place of service. Please express all of that by saying, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. We're so thankful that God led you to us in following the service. We're going to uh, ask the congregation to come by and speak to you and, and welcome you. And then hopefully in the days and weeks to come, we'll start to learn some names and help you find your place here at Earl Street. Would you please stand? Gracious God, we give you thanks for your presence with us, your love for us, and your faithfulness to us. We thank you today for bringing Deborah into our family of faith here at Earl Street, for the ways that you have already worked in her life to lead her to this point of faith. We pray that we will be the kind of church that will welcome her and nurture her in her faith, and also give her opportunities to serve you through this church. We thank you for the promise of scripture that though we are sinners, we are being made holy by your amazing grace in Jesus Christ. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. 